good afternoon. Good evening for those in Armenia, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, as the Vice President of the Center for Policy Studies, I'm glad to welcome you to our today's International Roundtable discussion titled Leadership in, title, in Time of Pandemic. This is a part of our project Protecting Democratic Values by Tackling Pandemic Disinformation, organized with support from the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation. And let me welcome you. And I'm glad that in addition to our usual participants, our colleagues from Latvia and Romania, we have also Maria Chutka today from the Respublica Foundation in Poland and uh, some of our staff will meet us uh, also online and also uh, the audience may follow live on Facebook and later on we will upload this uh, on YouTube as well. So uh, concerning today's topic, uh, uh, well, uh, as you may have noticed that in some countries their leaders just denied the pandemic as such or have been using it uh, to their political ends at different extents so if we consider you the european region eastern europe particularly we, we know that in Belarus, there was this approach by President Lukashenko that they have some vodka and potato, ride the tractor, you'll be fine. There's nothing to worry about. And then he also boasted that he contracted the virus at some point and just overcame it. So there was nothing to really worry about. But later on, just a few weeks ago, he used this, the spread of the disease as a pretext for border closure, which clearly has some political implications related to the post-election protests going on. And then in Russia, well, we see that the Deputy Prime Minister Tatiana Golikova at a press conference in December considered that the death toll was not, as they claimed officially, 57,000, but more than 180,000, so three times more. And still we have can see if the, we analyze the numbers that the official information is not very accurate or they still have something to conceal for example in moscow daily death toll has been in the range of 71 to 79 for months there was one day they said it was 81 then it again fell below 80 and it keeps going on. And same time, uh, Vladimir Putin behaves, behaves differently from Lukashenko. So he's not as sure about that. There is nothing to worry. He's been in hiding, sort of, with. Uh, visitors required to go through a disinfection tunnel and so on. And at the same time, we see that one of the abusive electronic surveillance systems has been used in Russia with people having to wake up at night, sometimes because their smartphone requires to make, to make a selfie to show that they are staying at home. And uh, this has been a trend towards electronic surveillance. It's 
not only in Russia, but in a number of other countries. And uh, it's possible to find a lot of information in a report published by Freedom House in October, Freedom on the Net. It analyzes about situation in different countries with abuses surveillance in the name of public health and uh, which apps track people not the virus spread as such but rather the people censorship related to COVID-19 information and increasing in some countries and then some countries also have been following more the Chinese model of surveillance state. Although this is more developing countries problems but uh, still in Hungary for example political opposition has been claiming that uh, Viktor Orban's government is concentrating power under the pretext of dealing with the pandemic. So, so perhaps uh, I would ask uh, Lafi and colleagues Artur Zbikos and Alexander Palkova to step in now so we may wait before Angela Granada also connects, uh, connects and then I would ask the Romanian colleagues to continue. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Armin, uh, and uh, thank you each and everyone who's watching right now. Uh, I would also want to thank our partners for this amazing opportunity to present um, uh, this study, uh, uh, our today's team. Uh, that is, of course, leadership in time of pandemic, how leaders contributed to propaganda and fake news, uh, in Latvia in particular. So let me share the screen with you. Mm. Armin, can you please allow me to share the screen? Okay, thank you. And there you go. I hope that everyone sees. So, um, how how leaders contributed uh, to propaganda and fake news in Latvia? Um, before we start with the examples, um, there's basically a summary, which I would call the types of the contribution um, in uh, in general, contributions uh, to the spread of the fake news can be divided into two categories. And I'm talking about specifically about Latvian case here. So the media lied or misrepresented what politicians have said, and politicians spread false information him or herself. Um, in most of the cases, when we're talking about politicians spreading false information him or herself, it's not that uh, easy to distinguish the motivation behind it. However, mm, from my point of view, and for what we have discussed, in most of the cases, it's an opportunity to some way bolster or improve the situation to show off, so to speak, to, to, to kind of make a perception of a situation in any way better than it is in reality. As for the media, uh, most of the cases, the media uh, is not very popular. I would even go as far as to say that in a way can be considered as a marginal media. And not only that, mm, Basically, it can be sometimes considered as a clickbait. This is about the motivation. So uh, let's talk about the examples. So example uh, number one. In June, then Minister of Health, Ilse Winkler, said that in case of high incidence rate, it would be necessary to wear a mask everywhere. 
At that time, uh, that is in June, wasn't so high. So masks were required to be worn only in public transport. Um, however, one of the portals published the article with the headline, according to which the minister allegedly demanded uh, everyone to always wear a mask outside. It caused an outrage in commentary section. People were basically mad that now all of a sudden, uh, in June, when again, incidence rate wasn't that high and actually going downhill since the first wave of the COVID-19, people uh, did not understand how and why would now each and everyone should wear a mask. But the thing is that it was put in the headline. In the text itself, uh, her words were presented correctly, um, but unfortunately, most of the readers didn't bother to read the whole article. They read only the headline, which is stated here. Um, Minister allegedly demanded everyone to always wear a mask outside. So this is the prime example of how media um, basically lies about what the person has said, or in a way misrepresented it. The second example is an even more blatant lie. Uh, in case of Minister um, Winkler, it couldn't be considered as a misrepresentation or misunderstanding. And after all, in the text itself, you can find the words that she has said, but in this particular case, very recent, by the way, uh, it's a blatant lie. So in January, a post circulated on Facebook and uh, gathered roughly about 2,000 shares, which is quite an impressive result for a 2 million Latvia, bear in mind that. Yeah. Uh, stating that Prime Minister Christian Iskaric will not vaccinate and would, now, and would not allow the government to do so because he did not want to risk their health. Uh, never did Mr. Karinj said this. Uh, the interview uh, was conducted recently, and he said that the vaccine should first and first of all be received by health workers. And not at any point did he say that mm, he would he's not going to vaccinate, or that he would not allow government to get vaccinated. Uh, because he did not want to risk their health. So it's blatant lie here. You can't misrepresent his words in this case. Um, next example is rather uh, disinformation on behalf of a politician himself. So at the start of the pandemic was March. Minister of the Interior, Sanders Gergens, said that vodka could be used as a disinfector against COVID-19. Uh, in a way, you may argue that it was a quite a popular um, idea circulating around that vodka and other alcoholic beverages can be used in order to disinfect against COVID-19. However, uh, in February already, uh, World Health Organization stated that the concentration of alcohol has to be at least 70% or or even more to, in a way, affect the virus. So um, it wasn't known information. Um, hence, um, I would rather go and say that Mr. Jergens basically didn't know this, but he still claimed it. So here is a great example of how a minister uh, I do believe uh, with the good intentions in his heart, but still spread uh, fake news. Um, I'm quite sure that there were no wild or bad uh, ideas behind this statement, but still, again, I have to point this out, it helped to spread the fake information about uh, the COVID-19 in particular, how to fight it. Next example, I find uh, uh, even more important because in a way it led to the demission of the uh, Minister Winkler. So according to her, 
the AstraZeneca vaccine was ordered by Latvia in the maximum quantity, partially because in research it was the only one that showed the ability to interrupt the chain of infections. However, the question of whether those vaccinated with this vaccine cannot affect others still does not have a clear answer. Not only that, uh, there is a quite an important chronological order. Uh, so stay with me, it's quite important to understand. Um, these vaccines were ordered in October. Um, in December, when the plan was presented about the vaccination, still were no, no uh, clinical researches that prove that AstraZeneca um, showed the ability to interrupt the chain of infections, which is very important. So claiming such a thing and uh, knowing that this is not true, you may find yourself in a very tricky situation trying to understand so why particularly these vaccines were ordered. Because again, as I said before, uh, there were no such an information, no proof of that. Um, in an interview with the public media, um, she also said that um, she made, made this decision by contacting with government experts, with infectologists. Uh, however, the one she mentioned <laughs> have said that he did not remember having a, com commun have a, having a conversation about this particular question and claiming that indeed there are no indications of AstraZeneca being able to interrupt the chain of infections. So in a way, it seems like a lie. And not only that, uh, it seems like there can be um, possible possible vile uh, or cynic uh, reason behind this decision. So um, it's quite important to mention yet again that uh, uh, Mrs. Winkler um, uh, demissioned was, uh, was demissioned in uh, recently in January and uh, now we have a new health, uh, Minister of Health the reason why she she was uh, uh, she she lost her job is that she was not able, according to the prime minister, uh, implement the vaccination plan effectively, and um, one of the reasons also is that AstraZeneca was the uh, main vaccine that Latvia purchased the most, and as it turns out this is not the most effective one, the, the most effective one being uh, the Pfizer vaccine. So this reasons, um, according to the prime minister, actually led to her demission. So this is quite an important. Other examples that I uh, do find not that important and that, not that um, good to show how this works, mostly, uh, interestingly enough, um, concerned not the COVID-19 or coronavirus and pandemic itself, but rather everything that it's in a way um, connected to it. For instance, uh, for instance, payments for those who lost the job, or um, how effective Latvia was uh, against uh, the COVID-19, or how many uh, how many COVID cases were actually, so to speak, foreign born? Uh, what do I mean by that? That uh, how many people actually brought uh, the COVID-19 from the outside um, and, and other cases, but not so much about COVID-19. There is a strong consensus uh, amongst politicians and amongst, uh, uh, obviously not all politicians, but uh, definitely amongst the um, ruling coalition and uh, the most prominent politicians that indeed uh, COVID-19 exists, that we have a pandemic, it's a serious one, and uh, we should take measures 
and these measures must be strict. Um, there is no denial in that, not at any point. Um, but um, questions arises when it comes to uh, something that is connected to COVID-19, as I mentioned before, uh, payments, as I mentioned before, um, as you can see here, vaccines, as well as as well as um, uh, restrictions and so on. So this is how uh, we see uh, leadership uh, contributed to fake news and propaganda here in Latvia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, Alexander, would you like to add something? Thank you, Erwin. Um, on this point, I think Arthur's uh, performed really well, so I have no anything to add. Okay, thank you. So, uh, before Angela joins us, Catalina, would you like to start now? Sure. Um, thank you very much, uh, Armen, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, first, uh, first of all, I, I would like to, to allow me to, to thank you once again, our men, and to entire team that, uh, that made this project uh, possible, as well as the colleagues who dedicated their time to, to analyzing the social and political events in, uh, in our region during the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I must to admit, that the topic uh, that the, 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 the topic of today's session is extremely complex and um, extremely difficult to address at the same time. Um, sure, uh, no problem, Armand. Uh, it happens. So uh, yeah, as uh, as I said, uh, this topic of today's session of our meeting. It's extremely complex and uh, and difficult to 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 address at the same time, because when we talk about leadership in times of crisis, we have to consider extremely many aspects, from social, so basic uh, aspects, up to the media, investment capital, civil society. Um, and the decision maker of, uh, of public policies and public agenda. And also uh, the transnational groups, because when you, um, when, when, when you talk about uh, governance in the time of crisis, we cannot talk about national leadership outside the international context. So the, uh, so the, 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 globalist, uh, the globalist one, therefore, with uh, with your permission today i will uh, i will put i will put the analysis of the romanian leadership from the last year in a wider regional european context because the european and nato membership status of romania um, oblige us to be extremely um, to be extremely attentive to this so the pandemic of, uh, of new coronavirus um, infections have shown us that Europe, whatever uh, we are referring uh, to, to regional Europe, to the European Union, or Europe as a continent from Lisbon to Vladivostok, it's a, high, um, uh, it's a highly dependent political and economic colossus to the, uh, to the Asian geopolitics. Moreover, uh, the pandemic uh, offers us uh, extremely interesting perspectives on the uh, rivalries between the European powers and the divergence of opinion between uh, between the European uh, between the European states. Obviously, uh, this syncope of European unity uh, offer enormous gaps to extra European powers to um, to build an irreversible path in their relations with uh, with Europe and even to influence the continental policies. Uh, here I'll give you um, a relevant example, and I think that it's the most 
um, the most important um, uh, example, China. China has taken on a vital role for its long-term historical memory. Um, China has, um, has taken on the responsibility and the role of, um, of a major global player, the humanitarian aid to Europe. Here, um, I could list Italy, Republic of Moldova, Romania, Ukraine, etc. cetera. Uh, this humanitarian aid tests the legitimacy of the European Union action plans Within the, within, within the union and in uh, areas of vital interest for the European Union. This is extremely um, annoying for both the European Union, United States, and even Russia, because it is clear that the Chinese avant-garde offers to the Beijing leaders and to the Chinese Communist Party um, a more political advantages and therefore implicitly economic uh, and spectral uh, and even dangerous for our security and for the Euro-Atlantic cooperation. So uh, returning to the regional issue uh, and implicitly to the national one, we will observe an extremely dynamic of the political leadership and um, a fracture of the European political unity. The pandemic gave us a clear perspective on the divergence of European unity, with each state acting to the determinant uh, of the idea of unity. Uh, we all uh, know that uh, the public health system, it's a vital and exclusive and why not a plenary area of activity and, uh, and regulation of, uh, of the nation state. Since the outbreak of the pandemic and until now, uh, no state entity has thought about what it's good for everyone or if they have done so, the number of states that have acted differently, it's extremely small, unfortunately. It is clear that our region, I mean, the Eastern and Southeastern Europe has been and, and, um, and it's very hard hit by the, repress, uh, by the repercussion of the pandemic. First of all, our economies have been extremely affected because centrally uh, the economic uh, efficiency cannot be compared to the uh, European economic engine, France or Germany. Uh, then our health systems were outdated in terms of efficiency, uh, financial support and preferencing um, uh, and, and, and performance long before uh, the global pandemic broke out. Also, um, the population of, of, uh, of our region has been and is one of the most exposed to, to disease. Um, for example, the lack of prevention, but also uh, ignoring health hazards uh, many of our, our citizens uh, um, are living on the brink of, subst uh, of subsistence. And this is clearly uh, an issue that the pandemic has made, um, has made us aware of, uh, of true value and magnitude. And uh, last but not least, I, I would mention that we have realized that whether we are talking about um, the EU member states, especially um, uh, the, the, the Occidental states, or about the Eastern neighborhood, we are all on the, um, on the verge of total dependence on, uh, on imports of basic materials. Uh, unfortunately, suddenly we realize that we are no longer producing anything, and here, it would be uh, worthwhile to analyze in detail uh, the national political leadership before the pandemic and to, to, to make a brief and realistic analysis at the same time for, for, um, for the errors that lead to this uh, global framework. But <clears throat> I know that uh, um, uh, our time, it's, um, it's, uh, it's very precious. And I will stop this and I will detail the Romanian perspectives on leadership and on uh, managing the crisis from a political, economic and social point of view. 
uh, as we show in our previous meeting, the Romanian authorities fall into the extremely uh, pragmatic uh, uh, typology of uh, governance. Uh, the authorities in Bucharest succeed to manage this crisis uh, in an honorable way, uh, although many mistakes were made. So both in terms of communication and in, uh, in taking extremely controversial uh, political and social measures, uh, some of which were, um, were canceled by the Constitutional Court of, um, of Romania. From a strategic point of view, I like to, uh, to underline that Romania and the political leaders of, uh, of the moment have centrally managed to offer to our country a privileged status in the region, but I will return to this, um, uh, to this uh, a, little, a little bit later. Um, at the national level, uh, certainly the one who stood out as an, um, as an image of the fight against the pandemic was totally uh, President Klaus Johannes. Um, Klaus Johannes, although at the beginning of the pandemic in Romania, he seemed to, to little interest in the, in the effects of, uh, of the COVID-19, um, could could have on the uh, on the population, as the rate of infection increased, the presidency became aware of the seriousness of the situation, and um, uh, revised its position, uh, placing itself in the position of an uh, institutional force in uh, in Romania. This was necessary for two reasons. First of all, both the president and the government were uh, political isolated as the social democratic majority in the parliament did everything possible to, uh, to, down, uh, to downplay the political and health measure taken by, uh, by the authorities. And even moreover, in the midst of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic crisis, the parliamentary majority voted at its discretion on salary and social rights increases. Even if the government sent a negative opinion to the parliament based on the negative economic forecast uh, for, for, the coming, uh, for the coming years. The second reason is that um, political and opinion leaders have adopted a hallucinatory uh, strategy. They simply denied the existence of the virus and launched an entire campaign to, uh, to discredit the president and the, the Romanian government. Uh, implicitly, of public health institutions subordinated to the, uh, to the Romanian government. In this category, uh, unfortunately, I would emph uh, emphasize the presence of an extremely influential person at national level and with, uh, with an extremely recognized notoriety in the medical field, both national and, uh, and international. Romanian doctor and researcher Adrian Freinu Cercel, member of the Academy of Medical Science, director of the National Institute of um, uh, Infectious Disease and university professor at Carol Davila University, uh, also former secretary of state in several governments during the pandemic for a, for, uh, for a very short period of time, uh, less than a month, he served as chairman of the uh, National Commission for Clinical and Epidemiolo Epidemiological Management of COVID-19 within the Minister of Health. He said at the beginning of, uh, of the pandemic that this disease was a simple flu that the authorities and, 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 and that the authorities had became inflamed and that the Wuhan region was just a teeny spot on the world epidemiological map within no risk of the outbreak uh, spreading of, uh, of coronavirus. Of course, then followed the several of his intervention um, in, uh, in the media by which he subliminally uh, contradicted uh, his, uh, his initial theory, also calling on the population to respect the most basic protection measures. 
he even advised certain drugs then the press uh, and then then the press uh, reported extreme um, extensively and extreme uh, uh, extremely extensively about Mr. Strainu Churchill's connection with uh, with that pharmaceutical company, but these dissonances, this uh, uh, how to say this uh, this polyphony in the strategic communication. Let's not forget that at the national level, the government has set up the strategic communication committee. Um, a committee composed of specialists uh, from the Ministry of Health, Minister of International Affairs, epidemiologists uh, such as Mr. Sreenu Churchill and the representative of Romania at the World Health Organization, Mr. Alexander Rafila. Both Mr. Sreenu Churchill and Mr. Rafila are now member of the Romanian parliament from the Socialist Democratic Party. Maybe it's just a coincidence. So. All these uh, divergences of opinion uh, waked the population's trust in the, in the authority. Then came a whole scandal over such a plan to, uh, to fight the COVID epidem um, epidemic that provide for the separate quarantine of families over the age of, uh, of uh, 65, I guess. This so-called plan reached the, um, uh, reached the press and it was discovered that um, its initiator was uh, Professor Senu Churchill himself. So the, the chairman of the Commission of, uh, of Clinical and Epidemiological Management of COVID-19 in Romania, he was removed from, uh, from, uh, from office by the, uh, by the prime minister, by the former prime minister. And from this moment on, an extremely deep rift emerged between society and the authorities uh, I can say even a division within the society and um, uh, and, and 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 things seems uh, out of uh, or out of control. The establishment of the two month state of emergency, uh, the exceptional show of force of President Johannes against the parliamentary majority that um, uh, uh, threatened that no one agreed to the state of emergency, uh, I shall remind you that the leader of the Social Democratic uh, Party declared that Johannes wants to become a national dictator to restrict rights and freedoms. And at one point, more uh, MPs of the parliamentary majority decided to share on social networks uh, a few posts of, um, of, uh, of President Johannes, in which he was presented as either Hitler or an SS officer. A clear, that was a clear reference to the ethnic origin of the President Johannes. And here, I, I, I would like to make a personal comment. Unfortunately, these slips were not sanctioned by any state institution, considering that this association of, uh, of President Johannes with Hitler falls within the regulated field of political statements. Even if the constitution and the organic laws in the field of security and public order prohibit completely this type of manifestation. So the national leadership was trivialized and discredited in the perspective of uh, electoral victory because two rounds of election fold, local and parliamentary, local in, in September and parliamentary in December. Then followed the social governance by military order issued according to the constitution by the Minister of uh, Interior and those a scandal arose uh, because uh, the one of, uh, of uh, those measures uh, uh, was declared unconstitutional. In this case, um, the government or rather the Minister of Interior made a huge blunder, changing the amount of sanctions applied to those who did not comply with the, uh, with the uh, provisions of military orders or measures to, uh, to quarantine or prevent the spread of coronavirus. Derby, 
the constitutional court um, uh, partially admitted the appeal made by the by the Romanian ombudsman to the government emergency uh, ordinance, which established fines for non um, for non compliance with the restrictions and the fines given us uh, as a result of non uh, non compliance with the state of emergency were declared unconstitutional by uh, by by the court. In this case, it was considered that the court considered that the law it's not uh, sufficiently uh, sufficiently predictable, and there were no clear uh, clear criteria um, uh, established by uh, by law to impose the amount of uh, of um, of fines. Uh, this being uh, set arbitrarily by the by the law enforcement. It is clearly. This decision um, further destabilized uh, the society, and at this point, President Johannes decided to to um, uh, intervene in the political game to play this political game, while respecting a, the constitutional framework. And it was uh, the president who assumed the role of communicator. Here, uh, it must be said that Romania was not. Um, accustomed um, to the to the current president, uh, so often organizing press statements or um, or uh, uh, public uh, communicating uh, measures of major importance. In this case, um, the presidency usually um, resort to to simple and uh, dry um, uh, press release, but not uh, not this time. This time, Klaus Johannes fully assumed all the measures, and he did so because he wanted to help the Liberal National Party in the election. It should be mentioned that the leader of uh, the, the, the National Liberal Party, uh, that was the prime minister at, the, uh, at that time, was an extremely low level of, uh, of confidence. So the Liberal government was in a partial uh, disorientation, and then the president's intervention was um, um, auspicious. Let's not uh, forget also that the president, Johannes, was the one who publicly assumed, uh, instead of the government, uh, the fact that in 2020, in Romania, will be no religious ceremonies dedicated for Easter, and this was an antagonistic position towards the Christian, uh, the Christian cults, especially towards the Romanian Orthodox Church, within which there were uh, deviations. Uh, from my point of view, the cults, uh, with few exceptions, have shown more social responsibility and have found alternative methods of uh, providing religious service whether we are talking about religious holidays or about, I don't know, about the funeral, uh, the funeral services. Uh, then things gradually, uh, gradually uh, settled down and the state institution began to, to function uh, satisfactorily. It is clear for me that uh, the public level, um, uh, at, at, at the public level, uh, the president and the government have been identified as guilty of the economic crisis. For example, the National Liberal Party lost the parliamentary election, even though uh, the party obtained a higher score than, uh, than four years ago. It is obvious that there were abuses made by the, the national institu institutions. This was also found by the Constitutional Court. And it is clear for me that there were errors of strategy, errors of communication made by the government, by the, by the parliament. But I am glad that the institutional and, uh, and the constitutional system worked and self-regulation between state powers uh, proves that in Romania, we can talk about democracy and uh, about the rule of law. At the social level, I believe that the government has failed to combat fake news, unfortunately, to combat the vaccination misinformation 
and uh, and uh, and uh, the fake news about health measures. So that uh, those mistakes leave room for a radical uh, for a radicalized uh, movement. Uh, here is um, he's a notorious appearance uh, on the on the political stage of Romania of the alliance for the Union of Romanians, AUR, um, which is a political movement or an anti-establishment movement that gained political capital using two distinct uh, speeches. Uh, first of all, uh, criticizing uh, measures to close uh, some economies, um, some economic areas, such um, hotels, restaurants, cafes, even the, um, the churches. And on the other hand, uh, they use a populist and conspirational discourse. Um, these two, um, uh, these two ingredients uh, gave uh, our an, um, an electoral score of ten percent, approximately ten percent in the parliamentary in the parliamentary election. So, I know that we uh, we and I talk a lot about the the the, the internal problems of uh, of Romania, but. I would like to to make another another short, short mention regarding regarding the our party. At this moment, this party and the political leadership of of, of this party has moderated its speech, and it is delimited by those parliamentarians uh, who run on their electoral list, but who they are part of other political structures. And that continue to promote radical and conspirational ideas. Uh, in the present, in, 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 even today, our it's turning into um, um, a conservative and soft eurosceptic party. Um, with um, with the consensus of uh, of you and with, with my colleagues, um, I will. I will continue my, my, my presentation with a few sentences about uh, about uh, Romanians' role at the regional uh, at the regional level, and I hope uh, you you will uh, will support me for uh, for for a few more uh, for a for you for a four more minutes if uh, if you agree. Uh, yes, of course. Okay, thank you. So, at the regional level, uh, Romania proven that. Uh, that it remains commitment to uh, to the Euro-Atlantic values, and uh, that it can act as a regional leader, ensuring stability and order in uh, in in the region. Notorious is the humanitarian intervention in the Republic of Moldova, and also uh, the assistance uh, provided to Ukraine. Uh, in combating uh, the, the pandemia. Here, I would focus on an extremely relevant aspect for, um, for, for my country. When the European leaders simply forgot about uh, the, the guiding principles of the European Union, about European solidarity, uh, the national leaders in Romania, especially President Klaus Johannes, um, and uh, and and uh, foreign ministers uh, Bogdan Aurescu undertook political measures and diplomatic uh, dialogues that would um, preserve the principle of solidarity in uh, in in, uh, in Europe. Romania has been one of the few uh, uh, countries that has kept its border with the European Union open. And also Romania has ensured that its citizens are um, respected in, in, the, in the European member states, but not only, and that they benefit from the full support of host countries and full assistance. And I think this, it is, uh, this is very important because among the Romanian citizens, there are also Moldavian citizens who have dual citizenship. 
I will give you a relevant, uh, I will give you a relevant example, an experience of a colleague who was caught in, a, in, a, in a, this pandemic in Turkey. The Republic of Moldova, um, she is, uh, she is a Moldavian citizen, but also uh, she has the Romanian citizenship. The Republic of Moldova has shown a lack of uh, accuracy in providing its citizens with, uh, uh, with the necessary assistance to repatriation. My colleague, having dual citizenship, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, had to appeal to the Romanian authorities in Ankara because the Moldavian embassy in Turkey, unfortunately, did not, uh, did not have a clear situation of the number of citizens, of Moldavian citizens, on their, or, or about their uh, geographical position in Turkey. And many Moldavian citizens were woke, uh, woke up, abandoned it, uh, at the airport because in Turkey, a single repatriation fight, uh, a flight was, uh, was organized from, uh, from the Istanbul airport to, to Chisinau. So the Romanian authorities, however, um, ensured the evacuation of all Romanian citizens, but moreover, provide assistance to the Moldavian citizens who didn't, who didn't have uh, dual citizenship, and they were brought to Bucharest and further and full support was provided to, to, reach, uh, to reach them to the Republic of Moldova. And I only mentioned Romanians' commitments to, to the Republic of Moldova and, uh, and, and the citizens of, uh, of Moldova. President Yohannis, following his official visit to Chisinau um, at the inaugural uh, uh, term of, uh, of Maya Sandu as president of Moldova, assured Moldova of full, of, of full support, political support in overcoming the health and economic uh, uh, crisis caused by the, by the pandemic. At the same time, the non-reimbursable financial aid, the fuel offered to the Republic of Moldova, but most important, the 200,000 doses of vaccine donated to Moldova are evidence both of the strategic links with Moldova and of consolidating Romanian's regional position. At the same time, the assistance provided to, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine uh, doubles the bilateral efforts to, uh, to normalize the relation between Romania and, uh, and Ukraine. So I will stop here because I have already um, exceeded the, the, the loaded time. And uh, I, will, uh, I will now invite my, my colleague, uh, Angela Gramada, to complete our, our report with the perspectives of, of the leadership in, uh, in the Republic of, uh, of Moldova. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your, for your patience. But only with the permission yeah. of Armen. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Katalin, for your comprehensive analysis. Yeah, Angela, please continue. Uh, actually, we we had a discussion with Catalin uh, these days uh, uh, about what to uh, to tell you uh, during this uh, this uh, debate because it, for us it was very important to to show uh, how the leaders act differently in, in the Republic of Moldova and Romania, maybe in, the, in Ukraine and Romania. And it's very important to highlight this regional approach of the, of the political actors and of the, of the political leaders. And in this regard, the Romanian-Moldovan approach is the, is the best uh, comparative analysis to, to do in this, uh, in this context. Um, I, I was monitoring the situation with the leadership in the region starting with May when I uh, um, uh, elaborated the policy paper regarding the leadership and uh, uh, how the COVID-19 impacted civil society in the region. And for me, it was obvious that we have a lot of problems related to the leadership in NGOs. And that is very important to organize some trainings or some um, advocacy campaign for, uh, for the leadership in NGO. But at the same time, we had a very big problem with the leadership in, in the politics. And in this 
case, the Republic of Moldova is the best example in the region, I think, because uh, from, from the beginning, uh, the president of Moldova at that time, Igor Dodon, um, neglected and even uh, ridiculized the, the impact of COVID-19 on, on the society and on its own citizens. He even uh, um, announced the, the name of the first in Affected person uh, with COVID-19 uh, in in Moldova, and uh, after that followed the denigration campaign against this uh, this woman. But she was not uh, the um, the person who has to be blamed for what happened to to her because at that time she was in Italy and she wa was without a home, without support, medical care, and support uh, to be able to to take care of uh, of herself. But the president of the country announced with name and surname the, uh, the person who was for the first time infected and she was to blame for, uh, for her flight uh, from, uh, from Italy to, to Moldova. Uh, when, uh, from the methodological point of view, uh, we're, we're analyzing the leadership uh, in a country where in, in a civil society sector, you have to look at three points, uh, and all these points are related to resilience. First of all, we have to look uh, to sustainability and resilience. And in this case, we should think, and in our mind, we should have uh, the action that will help us to adapt in a fast changing world. Uh, what is the meaning of the resilience uh, concept? Because I think that we are still not aware about all the mechanism and on all the details that are related to this resilience concept and how the society is prepared to face new challenges or risks that are uh, coming from, uh, from, from the spreading of COVID-19. And uh, in, in this case, in this particular case, while talking about leadership, political leadership, we should think uh, how the COVID-19 impacted the decision-making process. What was important for the political actors? Why uh, they adopted a, such a legal framework uh, to establish a state of emergency in the Republic of Moldova, for example, for two months from the beginning? Why for them was important to change the legal uh, 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 framework? Uh, and uh, this was very, very important because they created the space to uh, take some measures and to adopt some laws that will be very um, profitable for, for, for the uh, people who are in, in power at, uh, at the moment. And uh, um, at the same time, I looked for the discourse, for the official discourse of, of the politicians, of different political actors or different stakeholders. And in my opinion, it was a disaster. It was a total disaster because as Kathleen mentioned, uh, for some of, uh, of them, uh, the, the COVID-19 was just a flu. They negotiated uh, uh, some uh, scams, some uh, some uh, deals among them, and uh, they never looked for strategies on long term. They never uh, took time to think about the impact, and uh, they never took time to uh, look at the legislation in force, uh, to act where is needed to support some uh, state institutions. And in this case, we are uh, talking about the uh, medical system. Uh, Moldova leaders just denied the impact of COVID-19 at the beginning. After that, some of them were uh, infected and uh, uh, they realized that their appearance on TV station was, uh, uh, was, was of a high, uh, of high importance in the communication, in the uh, strategic communication with the, with the citizens. Uh, mm, Igor Dodon even negotiated with the church the electoral support for his presidential campaign. He uh, announced in a, in a video intervention that the fines that will be uh, imposed to the people are not related or um, will not be imposed at the same time to the church workers, to the priests. And this was in, in a online uh, broadcasting. The discourse uh, was uh, heard by the, by the simple people from, uh, from Moldova. This is not the a way or a behavior to, to be adopted by a leader of a country in such a 
uh, uncertain situation in, in a pandemic time. Uh, the socialist, the government in power even negotiated with Russian Federation some supplies uh, for, for the medical uh, system. But these supplies were not so useful for, for Moldova. Uh, they denied the importance of the support of the Romanian authorities. Um, even this support was uh, without any payments. This was um, uh, humanitarian aid. This was the support from, uh, from medics uh, from, uh, from Romania. Uh, and those social media appearance of the leaders of Moldovan political leaders were, as I mentioned, a total disaster. And in comparison with what happened in Romania, indeed, we criticize here in Bucharest a lot those people who communicated to the to the citizens, what are the measures, uh, what we should expect in the near future in uh, uh, short term or long term and so on and so on. In, in Moldova, uh, the communication plan uh, is still not available for, for, the, for the public. The second pillar of the analysis should be the organizational resilience. Uh, and in this regard, I think the leaders should be able to, to respond and to be ready to act in an uncertain situation, to have in mind not only the public appearance, not only the uh, impact of COVID-19 on uh, their uh, electoral support or uh, uh, on voters, but to act in a specific situation, in a specific way, in a responsible way to take decisions uh, and responsibility for a certain decision. And in this regard, I think that uh, uh, we lacked leaders uh, that will uh, act properly in such a uh, um, in such a uh, um, uncertain time, and even uh, spread the disinformation or misinformation to uh, that was related to COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, they uh, were not interested about what is happening in the medical system. I mean, uh, in in Moldova, we have a, a, a lot of uh, doctors or um, uh, workers in the medical system who died, and uh, the impact of on on the medical system also was denied by the by the leaders, and the support lacked uh, indeed. Um, uh, we had uh, leaders who were not involved in facilitation of the logistical process. That means to, to ensure that everyone in the Republic of Moldova has access to medical care and medication, uh, that uh, they, they, they will be able to, to support the, um, those people in need who lost the, their job. Also, I think uh, in this regard, it was very important to think about the strategy on the long term, not only on short term, not only to adapt the framework for the political interest, but also to support on long term the legal framework that will ensure in the future the basis uh, to avoid uh, such critical uh, uh, situation. And also, uh, I think uh, here it, it is very important to um, to make the difference between political parties and political leaders, because I saw uh, even uh, if uh, we had a bad example in the government, but in some uh, uh, opposition parties, uh, we had political leaders that were, uh, were very responsible, and even the protests were organized with a limited number of people, and they provided medical supplies for those who decided in the end to join the protest in, in, uh, in Moldova. But also at the same time, we uh, were um, able to see how uh, the protests of fairness, uh, fairness ended in the end in the December uh, last year and how the Horeca entrepreneurs were not sustained by the by the political leadership and by the government of the of the Republic of Moldova. At the same time, I would like to to express the um, uh, to express gratitude uh, and uh, uh, to appreciate 
the way how uh, Romania and Ukraine communicated in this regard, because even if there are some problems in the bilateral dialogue, even if Romania is more closer to the Republic of Moldova, but the strategic communication was better between Bucharest and Kiev in this regard, between um, uh, ministries of uh, foreign affairs. Mm, uh, we had a lot of diplomatic support, online diplomatic support for those uh, Ukrainians who are uh, who were at that time in in Romania and vice versa. Uh, so you can see that the leadership had had a different approach, uh, even if the relationship was not so active during the, the last years, um, due to some political uh, decisions, uh, due to some uh, legal framework that was adopted in Ukraine. And after that, we decided to, to avoid uh, the interaction between political leaders at the high, highest level. And the last pillar that I, will, uh, I would like to, to mention here is the uh, future thinking, uh, to be a starter, to be a model, uh, to anticipate and uh, to be able to be involved in scenario planning and to organize this scenario planning, not only at the highest level, but also to the uh, public institution on local level to ensure that everyone is secure and that everyone has ac uh, access to humanitarian aid, to um, uh, medical support, and they will be able to, to take care about their own families and to take care about the, their own uh, uh, business. Uh, and this was indeed the most difficult part. And uh, um, for sure, Moldova has failed in this regard. And uh, because the leaders were not able to appreciate sincere what was the uh, what should be the approach to to the pandemic and uh, what are their uh, capabilities uh, to whom to address uh, a demand for for support for aid from uh, from uh, uh, abroad in this regard i'll mention only the european union uh, that decided to support the republic of moldova with the pl vaccination plan because at this time in January, we are not still uh, able to see what is the official vaccination plan for, for the Republic of Moldova. And in this regard, uh, again, Romania supported us and will provide some uh, doses of vaccine for the workers in the, in the medical uh, system. Um, in comparison, uh, I think Ukraine did uh, a good job in comparison with Moldova. There are still a lot of problems to be solved in Ukraine as well, and they also don't have access to the vaccine, uh, vaccine but uh, they are more active and they are more supportive with their own um, uh, vulnerable and uh, uh, category of, uh, of uh, people. Um, and uh, in this regard, I think Ukraine was uh, more active and more accurate to, to communicate to, to the people. And the, in this regard, we should appreciate any kind of support that was, uh, that was provided and any kind of uh, openness uh, to talk about their own problems and to um, communicate even with those partners that uh, they were not able to communicate uh, before that. So uh, in my appreciation in, in, the, Republic, in the Republic of Moldova, uh, I think it was very difficult to, um, for the citizens to um, appreciate with uh, uh, highest uh, uh, rank the, the activity of the, of the leadership of the country. But at the same time, we were uh, humble and we uh, were very open to receive and to appreciate the, the support from, uh, from um, from abroad. Of course, we still have a lot of disinformation and misinformation uh, related to this uh, uh, subject, but I think that uh, with the support of civil society and with the support of such programs and uh, uh, initiatives like ours, we will be able in the end to, to face this uh, challenge and to explain to the people why, why it's important to have a plan, to have a strategy and to 
uh, uh, support the idea of the uh, uh, vaccination of the of the citizens as the best way to solve this problem at this uh, moment. Thank you. And if you have some uh, questions, I would like to uh, take the chance to to answer to them. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, perhaps we may set the questions for a bit later. Now I would like to invite. Maria Chutka to make contribution, and uh, uh, she works for the Respublika Foundation in Poland, and I'm looking forward with great. Uh, hi, everyone. Can uh, can you hear me well? Great. So. Um, Thank you for introducing me. I am uh, indeed uh, based in uh, Warsaw, Poland, where I'm working for Respublika Foundation slash Visegrad Insight, where we focus on um, politics in the Visegrad countries. Uh, and today I would like to kind of um, first maybe jump into the topic of uh, disinformation and leadership um, in the time of uh, pandemic in Poland and uh, go over some uh, examples uh, maybe um, that are more about how the current uh, kind of authoritarian flirting um, or flirting with authoritarian ideas uh, ruling party, um, how it has used uh, the situation of the pandemic to consolidate its power. Um, and then, um, I will also want to touch upon the developments regarding the recent debates um, about freedom of speech in context of social media, um, since I believe this is a very important um, topic uh, in terms of uh, in terms of kind of defending uh, democracy uh, these days, especially now during the pandemic. Um, and then maybe finally, I will offer you some of the um, some of the thoughts or ideas, threads that have been um, kind of leading me in this research about social media, disinformation, um, in context of democracy. Uh, since I've been working on some projects related to that here at uh, Respublica. Um, and uh, yeah, so maybe uh, I shall start with some numbers. And when it comes to numbers, um, well, for example, um, uh, there was a there was a survey uh, asking uh, asking Polish people whether they would be um, interested in taking the vaccination. And um, it is only 56% of the whole population uh, that said they would be interested. So nearly half of the society uh, has some sort of vaccination, uh, anti-vaccination sentiments. Uh, just uh, this kind of number uh, as, a, um, uh, as a starting point for, for my next considerations. Um, yes, yeah, so... I believe that the main challenge with managing the public health crisis in Poland is definitely um, lack of trust in the uh, in politicians and in the whole political um, in the whole kind of public uh, service system, which is which is largely justified, uh, but unfortunately contributes to the spread of uh, disinformation with regard to. Um, to the topic of the pandemic and COVID and, and all the health related issues. Um, overall, the Polish government has not been, uh, or, or the, uh, the ruling party, the politicians, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, and this is of course something, something good, for the most part, um, they have not explicitly uh, justified uh, or um, Kind of outwardly, they have not spread disinformation about um, about COVID uh, and 
the, the main problem here might be about the way the information about the epidemic state um, is, uh, is supplied and is kind of distributed. That might kind of um, stir up some, some doubts among the population since, uh, for example, at one point, uh, somebody discovered that the data that the government has been relying on is put together by an 18 year old um, who's just doing it kind of uh, for fun um, when he was uh, sitting um, at home, not being able to uh, go to school. He, he just kind of, uh, he was really good in maths and um, had a big interest in data. Uh, so he actually managed to put a really good database kind of following um, following COVID data, but once it, um, once it, uh, this information was, uh, kind of made public by someone, uh, there was, there was a big wave of mistrust in the public officials and also uh, the public officials have blocked, um, public access to, to the information, to the databases that the, this 18 year old, I was using to create uh, the database. So this is kind of maybe a little bit anecdotal, but uh, but this is just one example that uh, I think can make us think that, um, and very rightly so, that the, the government really uh, and the ruling party don't necessarily know what they're doing and uh, that there have been this, these issues with managing the public uh, health crisis. Uh, what I think is uh, more important, even more important though, uh, when talking about this is um, this question of kind of power consolidation uh, that the pandemic and the, the conditions of the pandemic have allowed for uh, in, the, in the past year. Uh, Cause it's, it's uh, very soon it's about to be a year really since the pandemic has started. And I think that uh, one such point occurred uh, during the um, May 2020 presidential elections in Poland, uh, when elections were postponed twice uh, due, to the, due to the pandemic. Uh, but the argumentation for why it should be postponed and the conditions on which it should be, um, the conditions uh, of that, uh, postponement and, and the condition and kind of all these organizational matters uh, about how it should uh, how it should uh, really be conducted uh, left a lot to be desired and uh, there were all sorts of uh, technical problems a lot of people especially those who um, could vote by mail were not um, able to cast their votes on time because they were not uh, receiving the, um, um, they were not receiving the, uh, the forms, right, where, where they were supposed to, to cast their vote, uh, just on time. So, so, uh, so there was that problem and, um, there was a lot of speculation or even, uh, I, I would say just agreement on the opposition, uh, among the opposition to the government that, um, that uh, it was really in the interest of the ruling party to push for, for the presidential election to happen at that particular moment that they didn't want to delay it any further because, um, because the run between uh, current the current and the previous president Duda, who uh, is kind of affiliated with the, with the ruling law and justice party um, he was really close to Rafał Trzaskowski, who um, was this kind of let's let's call it the the opposition and the uh, the opposition figure running for the for the office of the president. So because it was very close, nobody really knew who was going to win. Uh, but the polls were showing that this was most likely to be um, President Duda, but he was also losing support with how the pandemic. Uh, was progressing in, in the spring. Um, there was this kind of agreement uh, on uh, among par at least significant part of the society that 
um, that it was really in their interest to um, to organize the election and postpone it in this really kind of chaotic way. Uh, so that was kind of uh, one point which I think is is important here to to keep in mind. Another such point was, uh, and you probably have heard about uh, the loud uh, and the big protests in in Poland in October and November regarding the complete the potential complete ban on abortion, uh, which is already illegal in Poland. Um, and then um, public gatherings were banned by the government. And of course there was this uh, public health concern and all sorts of public gatherings uh, were being banned at that time. Uh, at the same time, um, this was also an example of, uh, of this important moment when um, when um, the conditions of the pandemic were such that that it really uh, was difficult for for citizens to and for the civic society to get together and protest and uh, kind of uh, show what was important to them. And then there's also a question of uh, why even introduce this kind of topic um, into the public sphere at this at the moment when um, when the public health and, and the um, health of the population is so vulnerable and in such a vulnerable position, right? Um, so that was such second second kind of uh, moment uh, that, that I think uh, is worth mentioning. Um, then there also um, has been this narrative of uh, of the prime minister and and uh, uh, public health officials kind of pointing to how well they've been doing um, with managing of the pandemic in relation to other states. So very often the um, public TV channel would um, present the stories regarding what the government has been doing in such a way so that uh, whoever watches it, they think that really the Polish government um, is genius and uh, and manages to pand the pandemic in, in the best way possible in the world, which is of course not true. Uh, but this is also important since uh, uh, TVP, main public television, uh, television channel in Poland is, pretty much controlled by the state. Um, and uh, um, issues propaganda, I think it's it's really fair to call it that. Um, and the kind of information that's always supposed to um, to to blame um, to blame all the opposition actors for, for various happenings and various things and kind of extol and praise the the ruling party uh, also in this kind of um, again theme of um, uh, consolidating their power um, yes and i think that uh, also it is worth mentioning i think that um, kataline was uh, late was earlier uh, mentioning that the question of the church and involvement of the state with the church um, while um, while the public gatherings and the protests uh, were banned, um, church gatherings and large church events were not banned, right? So, uh, so there's definitely this kind of big discrepancy in how uh, public, um, the crisis in the public health is managed. Um, yes, and then I would also like to um, talk a little bit about social media. And uh, it's increasing, uh, as we all know, importance for maintaining democracy and fighting the pro-authoritarian um, narratives. Um, as we know that it is often um, the social media platforms, they are hijacked for all sorts of political purposes, uh, but also they, they kind of uh, function um, to the benefit of democracy. And it's not that uh, we should really uh, condemn them, but we should rather find better ways of um, 
governing them and participating in them so that they at least are not harmful to our uh, democracies and, and the values of democracy that we're trying to uh, maintain in our societies. So, um, for example, I think that uh, this story is, is worth mentioning uh, in response to um, in response to this recent, uh, um, maybe not trend, but to um, recent happenings of Facebook, Twitter, and other big tech companies uh, banning some political actors um, or um, deleting their the content of their posts from uh, from these platforms. The Polish uh, justice uh, minister and the Polish government have suggested uh, that they want to establish a five uh, a five um, people um, organ um, that would um, that would ultimately work as a um, well as a, as as an institution that um, th where if you for example have some sort of content uh, deleted from your social media, you can go to them and uh, then they can tell you that uh, mm, this was not done in, in, in a just way and then the tech company will be asked to pay a big fine or something along these lines. Of course, uh, the problem with this is that uh, we want to, we want um, that misinformation, disinformation on social media and all these aspects uh, regarding um, political manipulation via social media. Uh, we want this to be controlled and managed somehow, but we don't necessarily um, want it to be managed by the kind of government that we have right now in Poland, for example, who we uh, suspect and, and we can uh, pretty much assume uh, will use it to their benefits. So this is kind of the, the recent chatter about uh, social media and disinformation um, in Poland. And I do believe that this is, a, this is very much in the context of pandemic because, um, because the use of social media, um, and I also had some numbers for this to, to kind of show this, um, that the use of social media during the pandemic has uh, risen very significantly and um, as, as much as by, um, I think in Poland, it's um, Facebook recorded, for example, a 50% growth in the number of messages, including Messenger and WhatsApp, um, while Twitter private messages have also grown by um, one third. So, so these are really kind of uh, big increases uh, and big changes um, to how social media is used for communication, for uh, uh, finding news, um, for looking for information, and effectively uh, that it also is used more and more for the purposes of political manipulation. And, and uh, this is also not, uh, this is also nothing new, um, but it is something to, I think, uh, keep in mind, uh, as I said, so that we, we can uh, try to make these social media platforms um, maybe not perfect, because that's impossible with, with any of the man-made systems, but that we should really try to um, work uh, ideally at an international level to make them um, um, not harmful, at least, to democracy. Um, and for that purpose, I would also recommend to you, and maybe I will also finish on that note, a recent uh, Oxford uh, Internet Institute study, um, where um, I think this was published literally uh, less than less than two weeks ago, um, where where they present findings about organized political uh, manipulation by state actors and by political actors um, in 81 countries in the world. And in the case of Poland, the situation has worsened in the, in the past two years. 
Um, and um, there's also a lot of data about and research and investigation about how political disinformation uh, and bots and trolls and uh, and these kinds of organized forms, uh, so cyber troops effectively, have been used um, in the 2020 uh, presidential election in Poland. Uh, and so yes, I, I think that's uh, that will be it for my short. Um, overview. Uh, I would welcome any questions and uh, also I am excited to um, to discuss these things more with you in a little bit. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much Maria and uh, any questions? Uh, well our colleagues, colleague Artus because may have to leave soon so I would ask to ask him first if possible. Yeah, I I have a question for um, for uh, for both uh, for both colleagues for for Arthur and for um, for uh, for Maricia. Uh, what is in your opinion? Because th 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 this is very important for for us to understand, and I think that for uh, for the for the public, what is in your opinion um, about how uh, EU action? In this pandemic, uh, in this pandemic crisis, mm, you mean how the European Union acted? How well? How good? How effective? Uh, yeah, yeah. And and if the European Union succeed to manage this uh, th this pandemic, uh, you see, from my perspective, uh, it, the responsibility mostly backs uh, on the shoulders of the states rather than the European Union. Obviously, the EU is, um, plays an important role, for, for, for instance, in the vaccination processes, as well as uh, closing borders, uh, especially external borders with other states, and so on. But uh, in most of the cases, when we're talking about how effective uh, was the European Union, uh, in case of battling is the COVID-19, I do believe we first and foremost have to ask the states themselves, because otherwise, uh, if the European Union is the one who is responsible for the actions, I guess we would see more or less the exact same picture. Uh, however, there is a significant difference between the states, even more so between the regions, within the regions, for instance, we have uh, just just for the, for the sake of the analysis, we have Denmark and Finland, and we have Sweden. So the difference between these three states, especially between, um, between uh, Denmark, Finland, and Sweden, Sweden definitely uh, popped out uh, with their actions and we can't blame or in any way um, somehow analyze the actions of the European Union here because Sweden was responsible for uh, for uh, for for its own for its own uh, uh, actions so this is how I see it I don't think that um, we should uh, we should look um, into the European Union mostly when it comes to effectiveness uh, uh, against the, the COVID nineteen. Rather, ask very specific questions such as uh, how the European Union was uh, in terms of vaccination processes, in particular uh, buying these vaccines or how the European Union was effective when it comes to border managing. These very specific questions, I do believe, have their own place and should be asked. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. I would have, I would have if I may, two uh, kind of points uh, when it comes to the EU's role in that. Um, first one is um, more kind of Poland specific. Um, I think that in the context of Polish, uh, of the Polish government and what it has been doing uh, and what it has become um, 
easier for the for the current government to do because of the pandemic it's particularly important um for the eu um to kind of um uh to look out for poland in a way and uh, and and uh, um keep it close especially like in the context of hungary and poland uh, uh and the whole rule of law uh drama <laughs> Uh, in the recent months. So that's kind of, that's one point. And the other point is that um, managing disinformation uh, is one of the key uh, elements to uh, managing the pandemic and the public health and managing disinformation has to happen at that transnational um, European level. So I would not kind of minimize uh, the role that the EU can take here. Of course, it ultimately uh, comes down to, to internal uh, conditions of particular states, but that this information part and, and managing that, I think, is very much and should be a priority for the EU. Yeah, thank you very much. As I understand uh, from, uh, from Armen, I have a question from, uh, from Artur. And it's related to, to Moldova, but I would like to ask you, uh, Arthur, if uh, you have in mind the pandemic situation or in general the political situation. Mm, can you please specify? Uh, uh, you asked how the situation changed in Moldova after Maya Sandu came into. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, in terms of uh, pandemic, uh, maybe some new actions were taken or maybe not some something were reversed and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in this regard, it's very important to 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 be very specific because uh, now we have an interim government in the Republic of Moldova. So we don't have a minister of uh, health mm. uh, to be able to organize the work of the of the uh, minister of health in, in, in to support the the vaccination program. Uh, I think in that minister we have only a, a state uh, secretary, and it's very difficult to communicate with with that person to to Maya Sandu because they are from opposite uh, opposite parties. But what she did in one month of her presidency, she uh, asked for support from European Union. And in this regard, she had this official visit to, to Brussels where she met a lot of uh, officials and they um, managed to, to support the official uh, uh, speech of Maya Sandu in this regard with the vaccination process. And uh, the European Union um, mentioned that the officials from the European Union mentioned that they will be able to provide the uh, the vaccine vaccine for for Moldovan citizens. Moldova is not like a Ukraine, a big country. We have only 2.9 million people uh, in, in, within the country in the on the Moldovan territory. So it will not be so difficult to support Moldova in this regard. And also, she obtained from uh, from Romania those 100. Uh, uh, doses for for uh, for the people uh, engaged in the medical system. That means for two times of vaccination pro process. As uh, Katalin mentioned, uh, Romania provided two uh, thousand two two hundred thousands of uh, of uh, vaccination uh, vaccine doses for for Moldova. That means. Well, 100,000 of people will receive the, the vaccine, but uh, only at the end of uh, January, we will be able to, to see what is the plan of the, of the um, Ministry of Health uh, with the vaccination process and what they have in mind, because we lack the infrastructure for, for that vaccine to be the logistical part of the vaccination process. It's not like in Romania to have this uh, infrastructure to, to support the, uh, and to keep the, the vaccine in, in a uh, proper manner. 
So in this regard, she made a lot of work. In one month, she she obtained the support of the European Union and of the uh, Western partners. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you for the clarification. Also, I'd, I'd, I'd like to i like to add something that uh, about the vaccination in uh, in Moldova. Uh, the Romanian government uh, announced yesterday, I think. Um, the, the prime minister, the prime minister of Romania, announced yesterday that the government is working to find the proper solution uh, for those uh, 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 Moldovan uh, citizen uh, who are uh, who, who who had um, the double citizenship, because. In this in, 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 in this moment, one of the solution bring by the uh, by, by the government is to allow the, the the Moldavian citizenship uh, the, 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 Romanian, the Moldavian citizens who uh, who have uh, who have the, the, the Romanian citizenship to to came in Romania in in Yash for 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 the vaccination and then to allow them to to uh, to go home, but. In, in this moment, we should uh, we should underline that the Romanian government are working very close with uh, with with the Maya Sandu administration, and this is this is a, a, a good thing for for um, for Moldova and for the region. Yeah, she's a city at the border with Moldova, and it was the former capital of Moldovan uh, country in, in the in the past. But also, uh, what is important here to mention is that for Romania, this is not only. Um, uh perspective of a bilateral relationship with moldova this is a question of security of national security because we have a border with moldova and uh, usually the Moldo moldovans travel a lot through romania to other european countries and this is a, a question of national security also not only brother country and so on okay thank you very much Thank you. And other questions, please? I would like to take the chance to, to ask Ma Marisa uh, yeah. if yeah, sure. uh, Marisha or Marusia <laughs> uh, uh, to ask you if Poland is providing some support for Ukraine right now as Romania uh, provided uh, to, to Ukraine and Moldova. And if the Polish leadership is active in this regard uh, with Ukraine? Uh, it doesn't seem to be. Um, it's taking some initiative to help um, at the moment from what I, from what I know um, in Slovakia with, within the bordering um, regions, but mm, nothing that I hear of um, about Ukraine or um, or even Belarus when it comes to the managing of the of the pandemic. Um, however, when it comes to providing support for um, Belarus in context of what's going on in there politically at the moment, um, there has been some. Uh, efforts, for example, on the part of, of the Polish government, uh, or for example, on part of the Polish universities to to support um, Belarus, Belarusian students, for example, and offer them scholarships to come to Poland. Um, but I have to say that this has not been at all uh, in the recent months um, a very um, a very popular, uh, or maybe uh, it has been a popular topic, but not as much as it uh, as it should be, and as much as it deserves to be, especially given the uh, the location of, of Poland and the role it could potentially um, play in uh, in supporting um, the eastern uh, the countries east of it. Yes. So, so, so I can't really say much more than that. Thank you. And I would like to ask just a question, Maria, about the attitude in Poland towards the decision to have centralized 
uh, who centralized the buying of vaccine. So some other governments uh, of you, some other member countries have been criticizing the Brussels as they put it collectively or the commission for not speeding the process up. So what's the attitude in Poland towards that? Um, there definitely uh, has been a lot of frustration in the recent days, as it turned out that uh, the vaccines that are, for example, planned for um, distribution in March have already been distributed, so that definitely there's a supply problem. Um, but I cannot really, yeah, I cannot really uh, comment, to be honest, on, on whether uh, on that attitude to to centralize um, the supply and um, of the vaccinations, yes. So so um, so so sorry, but um, not much more than I can say. Well, the Hungarian government uh, cites that as a problem, and that's why they say that's why they turn to towards the Russia and China. But uh, it goes on. Uh, first, they said they would buy Russians to pick five and then bought 6,000 doses. And then there was some kind of public outcry, so they stopped it. And just two days ago, they announced they would buy enough to inoculate one million people. So mm -hmm. it goes back and forth. and. Uh, I wonder if that's also kind of an attempt to apply additional pressure on the Commission and uh, to get some perks concerning also the recent disputes about the mm -hmm. budgetary, yeah, about uh, allocations from the EU budget and so on. So it seems a kind of political game. I think this is actually a very interesting and a good point that you're making because it's also not, it, it seems also to be our Orban's tactic at this point to, to gain leverage uh, in the EU by playing th this kind of game. Um, with Poland, definitely um, it has, it's not on the same page with Orban when it comes to kind of flirting with the, the Russian influence. Uh, Poland has been very kind of strictly. Um, anti-Russian um, in its uh, foreign policy, although that, that's also kind of a um, whole other question, but, uh, but definitely when it comes to Russian vaccine, vaccines and Poland, this, this is not gonna happen. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, some other questions, comments? before we wrap it up in a couple of minutes. Okay, uh, let me thank you everybody once again for participating and sorry for that interruption. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading your articles and to further cooperation. Thank you very much and have a nice evening and uh, we meet some of you soon again thank and you very much there will be other cooperation as well yeah bye have a nice evening bye bye bye